good morning. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name's Eric, and I have been on staff here at Faith Family Church as our business administrator for the last uh, little over seven years. Um, we're going to continue in our series in faith today, and but before we do that, I just want to just take a minute to just um, just bring some honor to our pastors, Pastor Greg and Angie, and just thank you for for just the leadership and leading and pastoring this church. Um, and you guys do an exceptionally well job at that, and I am fully confident that our Father is well pleased in you guys and how you do that. Uh, besides Pastor Greg being my pastor and my boss, I would also say my, uh, he's one of my best friends, and he's been one of the most influential people in my entire life in terms of uh, developing, discovering gifts, and uh, taking steps of faith, and so I just want to thank you for that too. So we're going to just kind of jump into this message. We're going to start by looking at Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Uh, before we get really far into this, I'm going to actually do a little um, illustration, and I'm going to ask you guys to participate. I'm going to read a scripture. I'm going to ask you a question. If, it, if it's applicable to you to, for you to raise your hand, raise your hand. Okay? Romans 10.9 says, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. How many of you believe you've received salvation? Okay. How many of you have seen physical evidence that you received salvation? Okay. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. How many of you believe you've been forgiven of your sins? Okay. How many of you have seen physical evidence that you've been forgiven of your sins? Okay. Uh, Matthew 9.29, then he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, your trust and confidence in my power and my ability to heal, it will be done to you. How many of you believe God heals? Okay. How many of you seen physical evidence in that healing? Okay. Matthew 6, 24 through 30, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more than food? and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds in the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet our heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of those. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, he, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? How many of you believe that we have a God that will provide? Okay. How many of you have seen evidence that God's provided? Okay. Malachi 3.10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. How many of you believe in the promise that God will bless you when you tithe? How many of you have seen evidence of God's blessing when you're faithful in this area? Okay. So I saw the most hands for, for seeing evidence when it came to uh, faith and provision, uh, faith in ble those blessings when we tithe, and faith in healing. Um, but I saw the most hands raise up for, uh, that was the physical evidence side, the most hands went up for the believing thing, uh, believing in salvation and forgiveness. Malachi 9, 1 through 8, Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, this fellow's blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easy, easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat, and go home. Then the man got up, went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe. They praised God, and, uh, who had such authority to man. 
Uh, it would have been really easy for these teachers to deny that Jesus would even have maybe the right or ability to forgive sins because there, isn't a, there wasn't a physical evidence necessarily for that. Uh, but it was impossible for them to deny when they saw the, the man get up and take his mat that he had been healed and that he had the, the ability to do that. So if we can believe that we've received salvation or been forgiven, we should also be able to believe that, that we can be healed, uh, that God will provide, and that he will bless us when he promises he'll bless us. So our big idea today is when you serve a God that's incapable of lying, you can trust every promise he makes. When you serve a God that's incapable of lying, you can trust every promise he makes. Um, thankfully, we have a God of many names. And uh, you'll see up on the screen a few of them. This isn't all of them, but each of these names kind of describes God's character. And unlike our character, God's character is flawless, meaning that he cannot stray from his character. He cannot change his character. He has perfect character. He is Jesus, the Lord who saves. We can have faith and salvation and forgiveness. He is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. We can have faith in his healing. He is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. We can have faith in finances. Hebrews 11.6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Uh, believing it in your heart is really what it takes to apply your faith. Your words of faith lined up with God's word and your act of faith make it possible for you to claim that promise of salvation. It's no different with trusting God in any other area. But notice that there's always an action, a step of obedience that's required to activate God's promise. Salvation. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Blessing. If you tithe, God will pour out blessing in your life. Uh, Matthew 9, 20 through 22, uh, just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. She had to do an action. She just had to, and she knew that there was power in Jesus. That he could heal. And all she needed to do was to touch his cloak to release that healing power. So that was an action she had to do to release that faith or release that, that miracle. Uh, John 9, 1 through 7, as he went along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it's day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with saliva, put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told them, wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. He had to, he had to, to be obedient to listen to do that action of going and washing in the pool of Siloam for that uh, healing to be received. Um, until recently, many of you know this, um, but I dealt with a, a back issue with several bulging discs over the last year or so. This started last July of 2022. Um, and it got progressively worse um, until the point, I think was kind of my low point was when our daughter was born in October. Um, I was unable to be present for most of the time during like the laboring time. Um, and I wasn't able to spend the night. And whenever I would walk from the room that my wife and daughter were in to go home to rest, by the time I hit the elevator, I had to drop to all fours just to get some relief from the pain. I saw several doctors, tried all kinds of different things. Um, still didn't get better. I improved maybe a little bit, but nothing completely. I went to chiropractor, I did steroid injections, I did physical therapy, I took different types of medicine, um, and finally decompression therapy. There were several weeks where I had an appointment every single day of the week of some sort. I, saw, um, I, I went and saw a surgeon in November, and this surgeon told me that I definitely needed to have surgery. Uh, Janu beginning of January, I sought a second opinion, and this surgeon told me that, he, without giving it a little bit more time, he couldn't say for certain whether surgery was the only option. Um, but I happened to mention to him that I enjoyed playing golf, and he told me that, that whether I had surgery to heal or healed without surgery, that I wouldn't be playing golf this summer. And kind of looking back, I didn't actually do this, in this at this point in time, uh, but if I could have, I know probably a lot of us have pled with God in some way at some point, 
where it's like, oh, if I do this better, will you just heal me or something like that? Um, I didn't actually do this at this point, but I would have, I would have absolutely said, I'll never golf again if you'll heal me. <laughs> um, during this time from, from August to the beginning of January, I'd, I would come to church every week. Um, during worship, I would get prayer. I'd go home, ice my back, and watch the message online. Um, in January, we did 21 days of prayer and fasting. We called it our pa prayer, power, and praise night each Sunday night during the month of January during this time. The first one was on January 8th, and I came to that night expecting healing. For the first time during this whole journey that I had gone on, I came not just believing it in my mind that God could heal, but I believed in my heart that he would and he could. Uh, but that night came and went, and I wasn't healed on that night. I went up during our corporate call for prayer for healing. Um, I also had felt that there was someone specific that night that I was supposed to ask to pray for me, and I did not do that. Um, a few days later, I was just kind of reflecting, and I felt like I kind of had missed the opportunity for that healing. I had that person, as well as some others, pray for me that week, and by the end of the week, I experienced my first evidence of that healing. I was able to play with my kids in ways I hadn't done in five months. Um, I had a few setbacks over the next weeks and a couple of months, but the thing that changed in me is I still believed I was healed. On April 2nd, we had our sink night. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, we do that probably four or five times a year, and it's an opportunity for anybody that serves on any of the teams here to come together, to connect, to celebrate, uh, hear any updates and vision from Pastor Greg. And the prior two sink nights before that, I kind of sat on the sidelines just because of my back, and while our staff would set up tear chairs, move chairs, tear down chairs, all that that I was just not participating in because of that. And this, this night was different. I decided I was done standing on the sidelines. So I was moving chairs, stacking chairs, unstacking chairs. Pastor Greg actually asked me to stop a few times, but I was doing this as kind of a step of faith, and so I didn't listen to him. <laughs> Uh, around this same time period, my wife and I had been talking about doing a remodel project in our home. And uh, I like, I enjoy doing building things. Um, and I decided to take another step of faith and just do the project. I think there's going to be a couple pictures there, but um, it wasn't just a little project. It was a project that I went into not knowing that I would complete it. Um, I, I didn't have the foresight to uh, take before and after, so I actually found the top pictures was what it looked like before, but that was when we actually bought the home, the listing on Redfin is still there. <laughs> um, but the bottom is the new thing. So we installed, I put new floor across the entire downstairs, floor to ceiling built-ins, um, some half walls with built-in bookshelves for a playroom for our kids. Um, so it wasn't a little project. It was a pretty big project that I was just like, I'm just gonna do it <laughs> and we'll see what happens. So I took that step of faith. On May 26th, I took one more final step of faith in claiming this healing. I played my first round of golf in almost 10 months. This was the step I finally fully embraced God's healing. It was the step that proved doctors wrong. It was a step that gave me physical evidence that God does heal and that he did heal. Since then, I've played 15 more rounds of golf, got my first ever hole in one, Shot my best round since I was a teenager and I'm playing better overall than I ever have. Since that, since that day, I've not had any of that pain come back. Woo! Matthew 17, 20 says, he replied, because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Looking back, every time I would go up to prayer with one of these prayer partners, I realized that I didn't even have faith the size of a mustard seed because in my mind, I believed God could heal, but my heart said he wouldn't. And so I didn't even have, my, la my doubt was my indication of my lack of faith. God uses our tests and trials to grow our faith. And this trial I went through taught me uh, I can count on God in all areas of my life. If he cares about the birds, he not only cares about us, but he also cares about not just the big things, in our lives, but the little details as well. Since then, I've started going up for prayer for things like tension in my shoulders that I would have in the past taken some ibuprofen and slapped some KT tape on and figured I'd be good in a week. 
Um, but I believe that we have a God that cares even about the little issues. Um, God cares about every detail of our lives, and if he provides for the birds, he can also provide for us. Remember the big idea, when you serve a God that's incapable of lying, you can trust every single promise he makes. If we can trust him for, for salvation and healing, we can also trust he'll provide. Um, many of you know um, the story of Abraham and Isaac, um, but this is, this is where God got the name Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. Um, after waiting for 25 years for his promised son, Abraham was told by God, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Abraham obeyed and took Isaac, two servants and a donkey, and set off on about a 50 mile journey. When they arrived at the chosen location, Abraham ordered the servants to wait with the donkey while he and Isaac went up to the mountain. He told them they would worship and then they would come back to, you, to them. Isaac asked his father where the lamb for the sacrifice was, and Abraham answered that the Lord would provide the lamb. Saddened and confused, Abraham bound Isaac with ropes and placed him on the stone altar. Just as Abraham raised the knife to slay his son, the angel of the Lord called out to Abraham to stop and not harm the boy. The angel said he knew that Abraham feared the Lord because he had not withheld his only son. Um, so this is where God got the name, Lord our provider. He provided the lamb. More than half of the, of the parables Jesus shared about were money. He talked about money more than heaven and hell. He knew that money would be one of, if not the most challenging areas in our life to put our faith in him in. So what does having faith in our finances look like? There are several responsibilities I believe God puts on, our, on us to manage his money, uh, but I believe the biggest step of faith for most people in this area is, is the area of tithing. And the first, first important thing we need to understand when we think about money is that it's all God's anyways, the concept of lordship. God's the owner versus I'm the owner. Psalm 24, one says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. So everything's God, God's including all the money he gives us to manage. So why is tithing so important? I've got five points I'm gonna go through, but we're gonna jump into, I think I have the list coming up, but we're gonna jump into just going through each one, one by one. Uh, so tithing is an act of worship and the first requirement to putting our faith in him over our finances. God asks us to give our first and our best back to him, and a tithe is 10% of our income. A tithe is a baseline for Christians. Um, we've established that God owns and provides everything and asks for just 10% of those fruit, first fruits back. And first fruits means first and best. Genesis 4, 3 through 5 says, And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. The Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect, respect Cain and his offering. Cain was angry and his countenance fell. Um, so we can tell that in this that Cain brought a, an offering at some point in time. It doesn't say whether it was his first. It doesn't say that how much he brought. Um, he just brought something, probably his leftovers. Um, Abel, he gave his first and his best, his firstborn of his flock. Hebrews 11.4 says, By faith Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he's dead. So you might be thinking, um, possibly, wow, 10% sounds like a lot. Or, man, that's going to make me have to change my priorities to do that. And, yeah, you should reprioritize. Every time we choose to put God first in any area of our life, there should be a reprioritization. Um, it takes a lot more faith to give your first and your best so do you want to be a, uh, have Abel faith or Cain faith? Number two, it positions our heart under God's covenant and blessing. Tithing is the one area in the entire Bible where God says that we can test him. Um, but I think tithing is really a test for us. If you do a Bible study on the number 10, you'll find a pattern with it. It op often represents a form of testing. Uh, Pastor Robert Morris says it like this. How many times did God test Pharaoh's heart? Ten. How many commandments are there? Ten. How many times did God test Israel while they were wandering in the wilderness? Ten. 
How many times did God test Jacob's heart by allowing his wages to be changed when he was working for Laban? 10. How many days was Daniel tested in Daniel 1? 10. In, ten, in Matthew 25, 10 virgins had their preparedness tested. 10 days of testing are mentioned in Revelation 2.10. The number 10 is associated with testing throughout the Bible, and the tithe represents the ultimate heart test for the believer. Matthew 6, 19 through 21, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but for, store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in steal, and in steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Um, I've kind of also heard it like this, is where your money is, your heart is. Um, so has, has money or things become an idol in your life that you need to take a step of reprioritization. Okay, number three is to choose to operate within his blessings. Malachi 3, 10 through 11, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your field will not drop their fruit before it's ripe says the Lord Almighty. Uh, other translations use the language, I will rebuke the devourer in uh, verse 11. And um, when we are within that blessing, I believe that he does rebuke the, the devourer. I've had situations in my life, um, for example, uh, probably five, six years ago, our furnace wasn't working. We had a technician come and he looked at it. He told me what was wrong and he said, I can either replace it for, or fix it for $1,000 or I can tell you exactly how to do it and show you what to buy, and you can do it for about 100 bucks. And so not only, I, I've never heard of a technician walking you through the steps to do something so you don't have to pay them. That doesn't make sense to me, but that happened. Um, I've also, in about 20 years of driving, only had a few issues ever with my vehicles, like two or three issues ever, um, other than just general maintenance. And I think that's kind of unheard of, especially we have our two cars that we have right now are 18 and 16 years old. We don't have brand new cars and we still don't have a ton of problems with them. Uh, number four is that good stewardship starts with tithing. Tithing is being faithful in the little. If we're managers of what is already God's and he asks us to give 10% back, we can't be a good steward if we don't have faith in this little, little thing and it's the first part of his formula for managing money well. If we don't do that, we already can't get an A on the test. And number five, God can make a greater impact with what is placed in our hands when we release it than when we store it. Jesus feeds the 5,000s found in Mark 6, 30 through 44. I'm going to read through that. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place, but many, many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching, teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said. It's already very late. You've already gone way over on your sermon message. I'm just kidding, doesn't say that part, and I'm sure none of you have ever thought that. But send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countrysides and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to, to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them. They all ate and were satisfied and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. So this is just, the 5,000 is actually just the number of men, and we know that there were women and children also present, so it may have been more like 10,000 people possibly that were there. Um, but I think some of the, the biggest thing I see from this, that I take away from this, is Jesus wasn't the one that handed all that out. He prayed over it, gave thanks, and then he gave it to his disciples. If those disciples, knowing that there were 
five loaves of bread and two fish thought to themselves, this isn't even enough to feed the 12 of us. They had to have the faith to continue reaching in the never ending basket of bread to feed all those people. Okay, that wouldn't have happened if they didn't have the faith and they wouldn't have seen how much God can multiply when we choose to release it. Um, not only can he multiply what the 10% or whatever you give that goes out of your hands, but I believe that the 90% blessed goes a lot further than 100% without God's blessing. Um, I've never been in a position uh, in my life where I was like, I don't know how I'm going to pay my mortgage. But I have had several examples of, of taking a step of God and trusting him for provision. Um, and maybe that's why is because I took these steps of faith before I got to that point and tried to manage the money the best I could. Uh, my first example was uh, my first job out of college. Um, I did an internship and then I got hired at Weyerhaeuser. And this was in, hired in 2009, uh, laid off in 2010. How many of you guys remember what season we were in in our economy and a company that cuts down trees, sells lumber and sell, uh, builds houses? Probably wasn't the best company um, in 2009 in the middle of a housing crisis. Um, I had just actually just bought my first house that May and I was laid off in July. Um, I didn't know necessarily how I was going to make it until I got whenever or how quick I would get another job and how um, how I was going to pay the bills for that long in time. It would have been really easy in that season to say I'm not going to tithe in that season, but I did. I had unemployment of $400 a week. I tithed on that and then I ended up with some unexpected resources. Um, I worked a total of 15 months at Weyerhaeuser. I didn't know I got somehow vested in their pension, but um, I got an unexpected cash out of my pension that came in the mail a couple weeks later. Um, while I was there, they did an auto enrollment in, four, in a 401k plan where they would automatically enroll you in it. You could opt out, uh, but there was a glitch in the system. I never got auto enrolled in it, and they gave me the money that if I was auto enrolled, the employer match of that portion, they gave me in a check. Um, and I ended up over the, it was about three months between jobs, and I ended up making just as much as if I would have worked. Uh, but my greatest blessing, that was the provision in that time. The greatest blessing was uh, my wife, Hillary. She wasn't my wife at the time. Um, she had just graduated from college as well, and she was, she's a teacher. And so she had, other than doing some nannying that summer, she had uh, the summer off, and we literally got to spend almost every single day getting to know each other. And so that was such a huge blessing. Fast forward to 2012, we both felt, um, felt like we were uh, supposed to do a master's degrees. And so I did a master's in business administration. She did a master's in education. Uh, the combined cost of that was $45,000 over a two year period. Um, at that point, that was more than half of our combined salary. Um, it would have been really easy in that season to say, we're not gonna tithe, but we did. And right after I uh, got accepted into the master's program. I was um, given an opportunity to be a part of a leadership development program at DeVita is where I worked at that point in time. And uh, they ended up paying for 15,000 of my 30,000 for my school. Um, obviously we got the education out of it. Um, but by the time we finished our degrees, our salary combined had, had increased by 50%. The next season of provision in my life was, was actually accepting the job here at Faith Family Church. And I'm going to share this kind of ties into my last one as well, because they were at the same time. But um, I took a, a somewhere between 10 and 15 percent pay cut to take the job here at Faith Family Church. And it would have been really easy to say in that season, we're not going to tithe, but we did. And um, some of the greatest blessing in that season. So I, uh, I grew up, I, I believe my parents and my grandparents um, set a really good example in managing money. Um, and so I, everything I saw at home was managing money well. Um, and then I went into a profession with accounting and finance um, where I, I believe on average, uh, man, money's managed better in that industry um, than the average person. And so I basically had only seen good money management my whole life. I was under the, the lie, I guess, that everybody manages money well until I started seeing, seeing prayer requests and, and seeing that this was a huge need um, and kind of just realized this was a gift of mine. And so since then, I've done lots of one-on-one -on -one financial coaching. I've taught several different classes on financial literacy. Um, so really kind of developed it as a passion and using that gift. 
Um, and the other big blessing is the people I work with. It's not just people I work with and go home. Like these are some of my best friends. I love everybody that I work with. And it's, I think that's very rare in any profession. And uh, my last season of ProVision, and this was tied in because it was the same time, um, my wife and I, uh, we went through several years of like infertility and infertility, infertility treatments. And we were just kind of, it seemed like we were way into this process at that point when we started working at Faith Family Church. But looking back, that was just the start. Um, we ended up doing nine IUIs, two full cycles of IVF. The total cost of that was about $60,000 out of pocket with uh, the bulk of the cost coming within about a five year period. Um, so averaging an additional $1,000 in expense every year during that period. Um, it would have been really easy to say we weren't gonna tithe in that season, but we did. And uh, I remember this was right after I came on staff here at Faith Family Church. I went to a, a, a men's conference with Pastor Greg and a few other guys here. And uh, the song that, that Pastor Zach led us in earlier, I Will Look Up, um, that was one of the songs played during that worship set. And just some of the, some of the lyrics there, I, all my hopes and dreams and all my fears, I will choose to trust your name in everything, with everything. I will take you at your word. Jesus, you have taken hold of me. All my life is in your hands. I will look back and see that you are faithful. I look ahead believing you're able. Um, that's, to me, that, like, that last line is just like, that's, a, that's what faith is. We're believing that he's able, um, and we're believing he's able, and we know that we're going to be able to look back and see that he's faithful. And while we were worshiping this song, I said, with, said to God, like, if, if we're not supposed to have kids, I'll give that dream up. And I felt, I felt in that moment that God said to me, you're going to have your own kids. And that is by far the greatest blessing. I think there's a picture of my family up there, but that's my greatest blessing. And uh, I don't think it was by accident today that I kind of felt like I was supposed to do that illustration at the beginning of raise your hand if you believe in this. Raise your hand and all those different things. Um, but I want to take a chance to also give anybody a chance to respond to any of those questions. So um, if you're here today and you've never taken the step of surrendering your life to Jesus, accepting him in your heart, I want to give you guys the chance to do that. Um, so at the count of three, if, um, if you would like to accept Jesus as your leader and Lord, let's just raise your hand. One, two, three. Anyone today? Okay. Um, I'm also going to just go ahead and give us an opportunity to respond in, uh, we're going to, we're going to sing that song. I will look up again and, um, whatever it is in your life that maybe you need to, to surrender to the Lord or take that step of faith. Let's do that as we worship the Lord. And, um, there's going to be prayer partners, especially if you want a healing, a prayer for, for physical healing. You're going to take that step and say, I'm believing for that or for provision in your life. Um, they're there to pray for you. So let's go ahead and, and worship. And if you need prayer, pray. If you need to do even just the way like I, I spoke to God in my mind and just surrendered in that moment, if that's the right way for you to do that, do that. But let's worship. of this world I will lay them at your feet surrender every anxious thought for perfect peace your perfect peace all the loved ones I hold All my hopes and dreams and all my fears, I choose to trust your name in everything, in everything.
Sing, I will look up. I will look up, for there is none above you. I will bow down and tell you that I need you, Jesus, Lord of all. I will look back and see that you are faithful. 